This conference will now be recorded. Okay. I mean, I mean, what we sometimes we used to have a, a, a round of applause to welcome you. Uh, but you can just imagine a room full of 60 odd people are giving you a round of applause. Kelly Tees, can you now present your presentation on the track maintenance way? Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, Dave. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, just put a few things together here for everyone to take a look at. So, uh, if we make a start. So there's the contents of what we're going to go through. We've just got um, some key focus areas, standards we use, and then we'll do a little Q&A. Day-to-day uh, -day maintenance activities, some, there's some good pictures in there and some stuff that we've been through. Um, challenges, access limitations, environment limitations, um, some new technology, a little bit about PLPR, the managed track position, and just my involvement with the PWI, really. So uh, we'll crack on and then we'll pause at the end of each area. And then if you've got any questions to ask, um, send them through. Thanks. So some of the key focus areas for maintenance are so safety performance budget. So safety, we have passenger and freight safety, staff safety, third part safety, um, performance, point failures, track circuit failures, track failures, so cyclic tops defects, earthwork and structures failures, flooding and seasonal failures, hot and cold weather. We have budget areas as well, which we have to we have to work within a budget. We have to review our budget and we adjust the budget where possible with a bit of forward thinking. So there's a couple of pictures there. That's our daily report, our NADS, so the national um, National statistics we look at. So we have, as you can see in there, we've got some level crossing failures, track circuit failures, etc. Really, we want all them to be green. And then we have our life saving rules at the top, which everyone is signed up to adhere to. So that was just that bit there. So a couple of key areas for maintenance: uh, passenger and freight safety. So we focus on passenger and freight safety by ensuring we have a robust, robust inspection and maintenance plan. We use track 001 as the baseline for all our inspection and maintenance activities. We do look at other standards as well, but this is really our Bible. So in the left there, that's the front page of it. In the middle there, that's a PLPR, so the patrolling train. That's the diagram we have to build for that. And then sorry, to the Danny, right. Uh, Danny, sorry, play PLPR, what does that stand for? Sorry, just so it's plain line pattern recognition train is. Yeah, um, and then on the right, we have our actual BVI patrolling um, on foot diagrams that we have to use. So it's a good one, this, it ties in. So the purple on the diagram is an exclusion zone. So that's what the train can't inspect. So we have to inspect that by foot. And the diagram on the right there is actually Grindleford, which is, if you can see in the middle photograph, is Grindleford there. So the train will do all the green and the the staff on the ground will do all the the pink so that's how that one works there we have to review these every year as well to make sure that still within what we need to be looking at or any changes that we've had um some other key focus areas so staff safety we do a lot of work on staff safety constant we have constant safety bulletins rebriefs Safety initiatives, level one, level one assurances on the current 019 standard. We have various safe systems of work. So safeguarded, line blockages, red zone, lookout lows, towels. Um, so there's a couple of pictures there. To the left, that's a that's a lows diagram. So that when we use the lows, we have to create a diagram to show where our lows lookouts are got to stand. And the area in yellow is what the Laos lookout is covering. 
Um, so that area in yellow can only be walked or, or worked in while we've got the Lowes lookouts out. So doesn't do it justice really. That's a curved bit of track at Miles Platin. So, but the theory is that the guys stand there, they look one way, and the the guys stand the other way, look the other way. They give us a a radio signal, and then the Cos Lowes controller on site, he it goes off on his uh, his unit, and then that's the warning. Then instead of it being a, a lookout horn or a whistle, that'll be the warning instead. Um, in the middle is a line blockage form we use. So when we take line blockages, we have to fill them out when we're speaking to the signalman, uh, make sure we've got all the correct data in. These are planned line blockages. So we use them. And then the picture to the right is the actual front page to the 019 standard, which we work to when setting up safe systems of work. So that was just that. So any questions on the first couple of slides? Anyone got any questions? I've got just just one, Danny. Uh, the, 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 there was obviously the incident to murder fatality recently. Have you seen any any changes being proposed with that? That uh, you're working out on site. Uh, well, yeah, we've just got a few things in where we we're monitoring red zone and green zone working a bit more, and we're trying to be robust in doing more green zone working, which. Used to, it's always been the case, really, but it was just something we looked at with that. Um, our level one assurances are really robust now, looking at how many times we've had any changes to safe systems of work or downgrades or any time someone's had to get an authority number off a supervisor or a manager to change the current system of work. So we do things like that. Uh, has, has anyone got any questions on the call at the moment? I've got a quick one, Danny. It's Chris O'Keefe. Okay. Yeah. Um, just the you said about Laos on um, on Miles Flat and Curve. I just wondered where uh, where we model well, where we're changing the alignment of the Miles Flat and Curve. I know obviously you're aware of it, like, but will you have to update the Laos uh, diagram and anything to suit that, or do you think it'll still work all right? Um, I think I'm kind of hoping it'll still work all right because it was just the length of the curve which it covers. So the way, when we look. We, we usually over over egg the cycling distance on our lows anyway so it yeah. required 400 yards we're looking at probably knocking 600 yards plus just to give us that extra bit of wiggle room when we're working really so um, we, we, we will review it anyway when when we have to after the meeting so yeah, yeah. that's something we'll be looking but i think if i'm right chris miles platten curve will be cwr mm -hmm. so we won't be patrolling that It'll be done by the PLPR train, so it'll just be anything we do from a supervisory patrol or any like actual work we do, which is more or less done at night time anyway. So, nice one, cheers, Dan. Any other questions? Okay, if not, we'll, we'll move on, Danny. Thank you for that. Okay. So the next group of slides is about our day-to-day -day maintenance activities. So I'll uh, I'll crack on through them. So this is a weld repair we did on a switch. So we we have the tech team go out inspecting switches for SO53. So switch ramping, which is a derailment hazard. We pick up the defect using a various of gauges. I should have put them on really. And then the grinding and welding team go out and this one was a weld repair. It needed to be done within seven days because it was over 400 mil. So we dug down on the switch blade, welded it back up and then um, manually hand grind it to the right profile. So that was a good bit of work we did. Another welding job, so HRW, so that's the uh, head repair weld. So that takes a scoop out of the rail head now. Where we used to art weld repair, this will take a scoop out of the defect. Um, then we'll drop a thermit weld over the top, cut it as if we were doing a thermit weld, and then grind it back to the correct profile. This is a good bit of work. Sa saves us changing rails as well, and it's it's a better process than the art weld repair. No stressing required in the manpower is one man instead of having us to put two or three people with or four people with tools to change a small rail so that's something we do 
bit of repeat alignment faults there. So this was a work the tech team and the PUA team did together. So we did a survey and then um, slewed it back to the design that we did the survey to. So that was a good bit of work. And we did. Uh, drainage work we did at Greenfield. So we did the drains and then we had to go back and manually dig the wet beds. So as you can see on the left, they were pretty poor wet beds really. The drainage was blocked and we kept getting cyclic top TSRs through this site. So we took the RRV, road rail vehicle, and dug the wet beds with a slotted bucket on the left bottom left hand corner there. Took them down to a desired length uh, depth and then filled it back with stone and tamping banked using the road railer again to the correct rail profile on the top. And it was a good bit of work really, but as you can see the left they were pretty rammy wet beds. Same same scenario again. This is on the Hope Valley line where the, the, the ballast is very old and tired. It's not seen any new ballast for 40 years. So it was a good bit of work. TS, that's preventative work. It was a Cap D cyclic that. So that was a non-actionable cyclic. But as a route, we action them every 100 days to prevent us to get into having to put a cyclic top speed out. So that was good bit of pre preventative maintenance work we did and it was a super red which is a maximum standard deviation that we have so I mean, just just a quick one on on, on, on cyclic and, and, and where you get your triggers from is this from the to get these from the track recording train how does it how does it get input raised yourself yeah so we have the track recording vehicle that runs every month and then these these alert limits are sent out to the sections and uh, we plan them in accordingly to the timescales that, that are on them. And that's all from the track 001 standard, what I showed before. So there's loads of modules in that. So we work to that and, and then that prevents. So is cyclic a particular, is top a particular concern to yourself? Is that a, a key derailment yeah. risk? Yeah, so that's a derailment risk for freight trains, yeah. So that's what, and that's a, it's a heavy freight route that the Hope Valley line, so okay, it's, uh, Good work, yeah. Um, changing sleepers at Habersage, this was some good work. We had a rough ride, so the train train driver reported a rough ride. Um, it was over a small bridge at Habersage uh, that had Pan 8 sleepers. It looked like it'd be two old relays that had butted up but didn't dare go over the bridge. So we contacted the structures ram to tell them the proposal we had. So we were changing the Pan 8 sleepers, which were wood, to concrete sleepers to have that continuity of the same material um so we did that that was a good bit of work and it's been really good since so that was that we did it with the art road rail vehicle as well because we can't manually hand handle concrete sleepers summer prep so this was seasonal stuff so summer prep we do starting really around the january time go out fish plate oiling uh, rail adjusting talking all the bolts on the joints this is to prevent any buckles trap buckles in the hot weather so this is something we do between well we, we do the surveys early but the actual work commences from like january to we, we we aim to have it all done for the end of march so yeah so that's a bit of fish plate oil so the the guys are undoing trimming the trimming the joint ends so there's no birds on and we use a, like a kettle, like a jug, to put the oil in so it drops down the fishing surfaces, and then we torque all the all the bolts to the required torque settings. Um, reliability work. So I was talking before about trap reliability. So this is IBJ work on our cyclical maintenance that we do. So we change the old IBJs, insulated block joints, um, and we realized the timbers were split underneath so we changed the timbers as well to give it a good base for them joints to sit on so that was good long timber so long timber bridge it was a pretty bad timber bridge we had at whaley bridge so we tried to do remedial work with the resin and as you can see on the left we've got packings underneath to try and support it and it just we just had to, in the end, we just had to bite the bullet and go and renew the long timber. So we did that across the, the bridge. 
the guys that but they weren't very experienced at it so it was a good bit of work that uh, i went out on myself on that job as well so that was some good work and we did one each night so we did one on the saturday night and then went back the saturday night after and did the the uh, adjacent long timber so that was good for anyone crossing this was for star cracks in the bolts in the crossing this is a 1B defect. So a 1B defect is a seven-day defect, category defect that we have to put a speed on and it has to be done within seven days. So that was star cracking in the bolts. So did that with the road railer and, and welded it together. IBJ work again at Hazel Grove. So this was the manual. Instead of putting a full fabric uh, shop shop built joint in we put a fabricated joint in so we took the old one off as you can see the skins the shrouds were poor so we put it with a more robust robust bankler in and we had to use the stressing equipment to pull it together because it was in cwr so what was that this one this one took us for a bit this was a piece of swarf at ardwick station um so we had an IBJ fail, it was a bit swarf, so it was off the train filings or and, and the rail filings, and it bridged the track circuit. It's on a tight curve, this. Um, it took us for six, 654 minutes, and it cost us £30,000 that delay did. So we bought the, the small magnets, and we just clip them to the bottom of the rail, and then that attracts the uh, small filings or bits of shrapnel that are knocking about that could uh, bridge the, the block joint to we've never had one since touch wood so it must be working so yeah that was a interesting bit of work that's just outside piccadilly so that's why it took us for so much darling is that something you'd love to do elsewhere that kind of solution yeah yeah we, if we had the same problem in other place i think piccadilly section they've had it around the colonnade as well they've done the same and put magnets in so it's a it's a good bit of work that we share with each other. Thank you. Uh, another one, TSR removal, that's digging the wet beds out. Again, with the, the road rail vehicle that was around the Staley Bridge. So as you can see on the left, we've got the trace there showing the port top. And then we've been out, dug the wet beds, sleep, sleeper slid them, put them back, put the new stone in, then tamping banked it. So that was that. Uh, super red recite, re repair site again so this was just manually done we didn't use the rrv for this we did the wet beds with um, a gang of staff um, and did it like that but as you can see we're using lads uh, the, the traces to pinpoint where the problem sites are and then tackling them and reviewing them after that was a diggle same again at diggle that was with the road rail vehicle that was a few more so that's why we use the road rail vehicle. But yeah, so the good, good, good bits of work we have to do. So this was a good one. This one, was... one Danny. Danny. Sorry about that last one. Sorry for interrupting again. Yeah. So that's what you mean by the slot. Have you got a slot actually in the actual bucket to go through the rail? Yeah. So we don't have to take the the rail out. We can dig round the rail. So two slots go either side of the rail, gotcha. and then we dig it as if it was a, a just a normal bucket. But we slide the sleepers up together and then we that's why we've got the green markings to go where the, to know where the sleepers have come from so we can put them back where they've come from and then we dig dig the wet beds out to the desired depth got you thank you that was useful please um this was point failure prevention we did so we've had a couple of, we had a couple of point failures and this was due to the the, the slide chairs and the jaw blocks there where the slide chairs are there was elongated holes in the stock rail so the timbers and the and everything wasn't it wasn't void in that way but the actual slide chair and the stock rail there was in long un, elongated holes where the bolts go and the stock rail was moving up and down so we were losing detection at the front end of the switch in the yellow box so we we'd seen the fish fits being used so as you can see in the top right that's a standard fish uh, 
standard fishing, well, not, not fishing surface, a standard um, slide chair, and you can see the gap between the bottom of the head of the rail and the top of the foot of the rail. And the picture underneath is a fish fit slide chair that goes in, there's no gap, so it stops that movement of the stop rail if you've got an elongated hole. So we went through a phase of putting these on problem areas where we've had detection problems, and it stops us losing detection if the track when the train goes over so point failures and causes minutes money etc passenger performance so it's a it's a good initiative we use so we did that on a couple of sets of points now we're doing that all across manchester so that's a good good bit of work neil denton put us onto that so that was a good bit of work uh this was some work we did where we had broken fossil screws in concrete bearers and a long time ago we'd have to go and get hole masters to come and drill out the screw drill out the plug re-resin a new plug in put a new screw in and then the guys at crew come up with a way of doing it manually which was to drill a hole in the top of the broken screw and put a left-handed um, bolt in there and when they use the left-handed bolt with a left-handed thread they use a socket and it brings it out because it's spinning it out the wrong way so we didn't have to get hole masters we didn't have to put a new a new plug in we didn't have to resin the new plug in we could just take the old screw out and then reinstall a new bossless screw so it saved us a massive amount of time and money and it was good learning for the for the staff so now we're self-sufficient to do that the crew supervisor come up one one weekend showed us the cap numbers showed us the tools we needed and then we got the tools ourselves and and we're pretty pretty good at it now we've done a few of them on the on the regular really so that happens around concrete bearers we've had a few of them around chinley where the the, the actual layout's a bit tight and so yeah so that was that was a good bit really good bit of work some i did i did a a day with um some Works experienced students who were interested in engineering. So I did a day with, we called it Not Your Socks Off, Sarah Ogden, who's the resourcing manager. She asked us if we'd do some some of the engineers. I did one and one of the other engineers did one. And we talked about different things we do. So we talked about safety discussions, close calls, site organization safety. We talked about preventative maintenance and repeat faults, um, the value of a good scope. We did, and then we did a practical session in the afternoon on the stillage at Stockport. We got the, the lads involved by tightening up fish plates, scoping a, a joint, and we made it look we made it look worse. And then they had to go out and do a scope and then repair it how they how they see fit to get a robust repair. So that was a a good bit of work, and it, I enjoyed it really. It was good. Uh, check rail maintenance at Buxton. So it's a Schwag check. Yeah, just getting all the stuff. Because we don't really get shown how to repair these. You sort of like pick it up as you go along. So they just come in, repair They come in, renew them, and then go missing. And you have to just figure it out how to repair them and get the cap numbers and things like that. So that was a good bit of work. Uh, proper old school maintenance. This taking a, a crossing apart. This was on the sidings at Woodley. <clears throat> Uh, took, scoped it up, patrollers realised the crossing bolts were loose and seized, so we scoped it up and then the week after we planned them in there, got the block and we took the crossing apart and put it back together with brand new bolts, oiled all the bolts up and put all the wing rails back on and the new spacer blocks, so it was uh, one of my favourite jobs that really, I like, I like anything like that, that was good. Uh, so this is the tech, tech team using the uh, the Aptus cyclic top trolley. So we've only had this the last couple of years. We used to have the amb we've got the amber trolley, which just did twist and gauge, but then we got showed the cyclic top trolley, which also shows us um, cyclic top. So there's some it does a, a pre run and we mark it up on site. Um, staff can then lift and pack what we need so they'll tell them where to put the jacks how much we want to lift it 
and then it'll do a post run and tell us if we've achieved the uh, what we wanted to achieve. So the red line is the original rail profile. So when they run the trolley over, that's the red line. So as you can see, it's a bit squiggly down. And then the green lines are suggested repair rail, pro rail profile to remove the, the cyclic top. So we've got a couple of pardon me. So we've got a couple of there. You got the September run, which was a a twenty twenty seven mil cyclic tops, and then the October run post repair brought it back down to we were just over for it to be a sixty day cyclic, which was twenty point seven three. So we targeted the right areas there. So a little bit of voiding that could have been or or something like that. But uh, yeah, that was a good. That's what some of the new technology we're using. Um, same again, cyclic top, that's the trolley as well. So this was something the, the tech team did us. So the rail height pre and then the rail height post underneath. So the rail height pre was 51 mil. And then we'd done the lifting and brought it to 40 mil on the on the left rail and the, and the same with the right rail where we took that high spot out by lifting round it so some some good technology about it, it's just getting out to use it so old school msp in there on some jointed track so this is where we use the chippings we do the measure, measures beforehand work out the lifts work out the amount of chippings that need to go under each sleeper and then pack the sleeper and then let it settle. So this was some measured shovel packing we did at, at Buxton. So this was a good, really good bit of work, really preventative and prolongs the repair as well instead of just going and roll bell packing or kango packing, things like that. Alignment fault again, similar thing, what we did before. Small alignment fault going through. Um, and then we've just used the slewing jacks, dug the ends out, used the slewing jacks and uh, nudged him over with the slewing jacks and then took took readings after to make sure we haven't encroached the other line. IBJ repairs, resin repairs. So instead of having to change them all the time, see where they're just about to touch, that circuit fairly waiting to happen. We uh, we dig it out with, a, with an angle grinder, a little hand angle grinder. And then put the resin in and clear it over and it really it's a good repair in the bottom right hand corner there which it's pretty robust really if it's done at the right time sometimes it can fall out if it's not done at the right time or we don't do a deep enough repair so that's a track circuit fairly waiting to happen broken rail so this was broken rail oxford road this is what the rail management engineer does for us he does the report after we have a broken rail so so the inspection team on nights during a visual inspection at oxford road discovered a visible rail break rail break and heel the right hand switch rail to two four zero fours um just north of oxford road the p-way section manager examined the closure rail between the switch and the cross and confirmed the break noting a three mil gap between the adjacent sections of rail we informed control and we made the prepared to change the rail on the same shift the line was under possession at the time of the dis discovery and was reopened with no delay so we, we found the break on the night excuse me and repaired it on the night as well so it was um, it was a good response really and then we give it to the rail management engineer and he does he puts it in a bath and we look at it then and see what what could have caused it uh, so it was a corrosion pit just at the bottom there another one at piccadilly throat this was a uh, again we had a fatigue crack at the bottom there and then the slide chairs either side so it was it was smack in the middle of the yard of the bed 
and there you can see the growth. And this one, this was a hard one to detect by ultrasonics because the, the the signal comes straight down, and it's not a full rail section, so it was a the tough one to find. Would have been a tough one to find that. Any questions on them? Uh, there's a question from Paula. Uh, I don't know if you want me to ask the question or I can ask one. How do you manage repeat wet bed faults? Mm. By <laughs> um, we 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 manage them by getting the drainage fixed if if there's a drainage problem there. Um, if it's not a drainage problem, I don't know what could have caused it really. So it could be some poor repairs where we've uh, we've kangle packed the underneath of a concrete sleeper and broke that, and then it's obviously the filings from the concrete contaminates with the with the stone and the and that that can make a clogged bed. But it's drainage. We need to get the drainage right. That's what we need to do as a as a company. Really, we need to get that right. Once we get that right, we're We'll be in a good place. I hope that's answered your question. Anybody else with any questions on that? There's quite a lot of detail there. Anyone? Yeah, question, Paul, Paul Waterhouse. Oh. Sorry. Oh, do, you ever, do you ever put a geotextile in in those wet beds? Um, not. We we never do it now because we don't we don't plan to go deep enough to um, break up what's what should be there originally. Are you with me? So we we plan hopefully. Right. Danny, are you still with us? Myself? No, oh, well, uh, That's a good question, David. You can, I'm just making sure Danny's still with us. Oh, um, Dan? You still there, Dan? It Give looks like his audio has dropped off. It looks like it, doesn't it? I think Danny's talking away, yet we can't hear him. Do you want to just... Uh, I'll just go mute and I'll give him a call, see if he can uh, maybe load back in again. All right. Hi, Danny, are you back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you oh, seem to go off then for a second. Sorry. Yeah. Where did you uh, Kevin, Bell, you got, Kevin Bell, you got a question? Go on. Yeah, uh, this is this is really good stuff, for Danny, and uh, thanks for, <laughs> for presenting this. But on your cyclic top measurement trolley, there is it actually measuring? How's it actually measuring under load? It, is, uh, that, it that doesn't measure under some... load. Yeah. It'll only measure what it is. So, so to to be fair, that's all we've got. We've never had that before. So we couldn't measure it under load. But what we could do post though is put some void meters out. Once we've done the post measurement, if it's running good, when we've done the post measurement and we've got some some void in there, we'd have to take that into account and not give it back. Are you with me? So we could yeah. have we could have done the static measurement, which is great and it shows really well. And then the actual repair we've done could not be that good, and it could be void in ten mil. And so that's why we'd have to put void meters out if we were worried about it. Yeah, so it's it's a, it's a good, good process, but uh, yeah, I suppose the, the ultimate is the uh, is the track recording code, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's 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 the gold. That's the one you want for gold plating it. But it's good to find it. it it's a good it's a good precursor to help find it. So yeah, oh, th thanks, Danny. Cheers. Oh, sorry. Sorry, whoever's speaking there, that wasn't working very well. Do you want to put your question in the actual um, chat? That might be better. Uh, there's a question from Nick there. Have you got that one? Danny? From Nick. Yeah, yeah, so it is. You're right, Nick. It is. It's it's very important to coal bolt expand all rail holes when we do them. Um, it's very important. That is a massive, a massive pre preventative way of stopping star cracking. Um, something we were mandated to do anyway, so we should be doing that. So yeah. 
So that's where we drill a hole. Um, and then we put the, we expand the hole and put a, I think it's called the, it's a sleeve we put in there. And then we, we obviously put the, put the hole back together, uh, put the joint back together then with the bolts. But that prevents the, the inside of the hole from, from any, uh, any load and obviously the star crack in there. It's a good. It's good. It's a good process to use. There's a question Thanks, also. Man. Yeah, I've got one from Viva about. So, what are your thoughts on pumping stations for low line track? Say that again. What are your thoughts on pumping stations for low line track? Pumping stations. <laughs> Not really thought about it to be fair. Yeah. Oh, so where where it's um, yeah, so where you've got drainage problems, yeah. Yeah, you could yeah. put pumps in. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, you could put pumps in. We have we have some pumps when we have drainage issues. It's more to pump when we have like flooding. Really, we we have a lot of flooding sites, so we use the pumps then. But you could you could use that if you're having repeat wet yard sites, wet bed sites. Then if you're having trouble with any of the the drainage and the outfalls are broken, we have a pump in at Ashton underline because. Someone in the wisdom built a car park over our outfall. So we have a pump. Yeah, we have a we have a pump there, <laughs> which it's just what we have to do at the moment, and it keeps it off. But I believe there's 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 talk that's going to get fixed. But yeah, but the actual track the last, last question probably Dan, and then we'll we'll move on if that's okay. Um, yeah. So I think it's Curtis. Uh, apologies for the audio. How often do you analyse SDs? Is this a maintenance activity you undertake regularly? Yep, yeah, so we, we look at them every month. So every month we get the run, we look at them, and then we do our trace reviews every 12 weeks. So we look at we look at the traces as well. So the SDs are monitored every month when we do our very poor apes, pores, and super red analysis to send out to the, the sections to do their inspections. So that's done every month, yeah. Okay, Dan, do you want to, I know you've got a few more slides, so do you want to go yeah. to the next section, please? Thank you. Yeah, so some of, some of the challenges. We've lost you again, David. Access uh, limitations Daniel, you. that we face. So, um, so a massive challenge we face in maintenance is when we have change of operating context. This is either speed increase, tonnage increase. And change of vehicles or even all so that's that's a challenge we have we have deferred renewals um and how they are communicated to the team that's a challenge but this is recently improved and we follow the radar so that's a risk assessment done so we do a risk assessment after the renewal has been cancelled um this has been doing we've been doing we've done a couple lately so that's good uh, knowledge gaps with frontline staff this is due to we've lost a lot of experience maintenance staff over the years who have retired or left or gone to different jobs so we, we we want to bridge these gaps by freeing up myself, the section manager supervisor's time to to get out on site and help with repair methods and and to bridge them knowledge gaps. Well, one thing I'm putting is about knowledge gaps at a higher level. I, I believe sometimes we get non-realistic targets, and if the right conversations were had with the relevant parties, realistic targets could be set and reached. Uh, new initiatives rush through, even though they don't satisfy the end user and don't provide all the benefits needed by the end user. So Tiger, LADS, decision support tools. Um, ensuring standards are driven down to ground level through briefing and site visits. This is hard due to time, time constraints. So we'll carry on. So this is something I, was, I just wanted to show you about tonnage increases. So in nine years, Can't hear Danny. Yeah, I'll, I'll type again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is lads. This is a picture of lads. So this is a new initiative. So lads, I use lads a lot. Following cab rides, uh, I use it to help me with that pinpointing areas that I found when I've done a cab ride. But the problem we have with lads is it doesn't get updated quick enough with the new data. 
So this is just a copy of a preference that I use. So this is my preference. You can set different preferences to suit what you want to look at. So as you can see, that's the picture of the site, curvature, line speed, rail age, dip angles, sleeper age, ballast age, and then twist top and alignment. And it, and it goes a bit further down, couldn't get it all on. But that's Sorry, something Danny. I use. Danny, you broke then just the previous slide for some reason, but just, just on this one, lads, what, what, what is that? What's, what's, it, what's it called again? The linear... Oh, God, I can't remember now. Yeah, <laughs> system. System. yeah that's it. The linear acid. <laughs> that was it, yeah. So, so is, yeah. is this available for everyone, or is it just mainly maintenance? Um, we have to do a course to use it, so I don't think it's available for everyone. Mm. I'm not too sure, but we have to do a course a long time to use it. And then we got put on onto to be able to use it as like a, a user then. You might be able to get that now. I don't think there's a course going. But it is a handy bit just, of kit. Can you just link back to your last slide just to just make sure we covered it if you don't mind? Yeah. Yeah. Just to, you, you broke up you 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 Oh sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so this was the challenge I was talking about where we have change in operating context where tonnage increase, speed increase, or even vehicles or all increases. So I was just saying how our freight routes have really shot up tonnage and tonnage wise and the low line speed but very heavy traffic over them. So for instance, if you think about Peak Forest, it's gone from a Cat 4 to a Cat 1 track in nine years. And the Buxton to Hind low line, that's that's that moves up, that'll be moving up again, I believe, through HS2 and MBR movement by rail. So it's just we've got a, it's a massive challenge to stay on top of this to make sure we've got and we, we and really we've only got the staffing levels from phase two BC at the moment. So we have to keep reviewing it and then You dropped out again, Daniel. Can you hear me now? I can. We're back on. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. Did. did you get the stuff on, lads? Yeah. 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 So I just wanted to put in something about the recent COVID nineteen challenges we've had. Um, it was quite a testing time for all the staff within maintenance depots. It was especially hard through the early weeks into the pandemic, because TME, section managers, supervisors, and frontline had no real guidance other than the government policies that were published on the news. It was a constant battle as the management teams were always finding out the f after the frontline staff due to the unions advising their members before we got the data through to, to review and digest. We, we got through it in the end, so we're not in a bad place with it now. Um, got through a sticky patch, common sense and treating everyone like adults. Came out the other end uh, as a stronger team, really, and the trust within the teams has really grown and brought us close together. So. That was that. The other the other thing about COVID-19 was it brought some benefits. <laughs> and I know that's not a nice thing to say, but the benefits of the way we worked through the period where we got a lot more done because of we, we had a bit more time. We, we, we realised we had more time doing, be able to do preventative maintenance. Um, we've been able to scope, scope work more thoroughly. Um, there's been a reduction of traffic on some routes as well. It allowed us to do more robust repairs in in daylight because of the re reduction in traffic, um, and we we got to spend a bit more time on the side with the frontline staff due to less meetings, um, cancelled due to social distancing. So that was a was a a plus out of it. You could have a plus out of it, but that was definitely a plus. But the rest of it was it was a tough little air, tough little period of time really. So access limitations. So. Section five midweek is very limited. We get four hours most routes. That's like an average. Some, some, some will get less, some will get more. 
Um, this will reduce when new new projects are finished. So MWEP, TIU, MBR. So where we get four hours, we might get three hours, two and a half hours to to, to do work. Um, got issues with getting real, rules of the route possessions on time. This is due to not enough drivers to move empty stock to the depots from the stations. So Piccadilly and main stations, if we have a book possession for half 12, we're not usually getting it till one o'clock sometimes, 10 past one. There's not enough staff to move, staff to move the empty stock drivers. Uh, daytime access is very limited now, not allowing us to make repairs in daylight. But this would be our preferred method, giving us a better standard of repair and working in the natural light of day. And lots of work is being crammed into small possessions. So some are getting in, so, so, so in some way we are getting, uh, sometimes we're getting P-way off track, s and IP work structures and works delivery. Could be working in this a small work site and it's really tough to manage sometimes so that's some of the so to, to counteract some of this stuff the daytime access we've created a what's called a cat register don't ask me what cat means dave i don't know um a cat register so this this allows us to look at the signal as workload and if we see a gap we can book a line blockage if we see that there's too many line blockages in there we, we know not to go and apply for one because it's just going to get knocked back and this is for all disciplines that we have this so uh, this is this signal box is new mill south so as you can see that there's a tab at the bottom with with signal boxes um this is the day and date obviously down the side thursday's the date signal box uh the gap there we could apply for a line blockage there on that day that's a gap that we could take one blue this is a cyclical line blockage that would use for patrolling etc or s and have could have their cyclical maintenance booked in there and green that's it that's a line blockage that's been accepted and processed through the gazette the gazette process or the green zone access that that's been accepted and ready to go so it's, it's been a good bit of work really it's it's not it, we don't feel like we're wasting our time now applying for stuff to get knocked back we can see where the gaps are so any questions on them Any questions from anybody? Yeah, Dan, I've got another one for you, mate. Um, it's Go on, Chris. Chris. Just sorry, you know the you know the you say about COVID, this gives you more time to do stuff better and like a bit more time to scope things up, and that part of that's because it's you're not going to meetings all the time. Do you yeah. think like once COVID has passed, do you think you think your meetings will go back to the way they were before and you'll end up with less time again? Or do you think that everyone will kind of think, oh, we've got more time to do? We've got, we don't need as many meetings and we can spend more time doing the actual work. Um, I, I personally think it will go back to how it was, Chris. That's my personal thought, but I, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> That's my hope. But my personal thought is it'll go back to how it was because sometimes we need a meeting to to justify another meeting don't we or we need to have a meeting to talk about a meeting coming up and things like that but that's my hope my hope is that it stays quite how, how we are now with meetings and it it's been really productive and but i i have no faith in that it will stay like that i think it'll go back to yeah it, how it was happening across different industries actually where there's like windows of opportunity here isn't there every cloud has a silver lining and uh, and the rail industry you know we can make the most most of the uh, additional access and you see it on the roads as well you know there's more going on there than ever at the moment where people are you know making the most of the access yeah i, I agree and, with you kevin yeah and fair play to them as well you know mm -hmm. if, if uh, try and make the most of the opportunities as it as it is the window oppor opportunity that is anyway yeah yeah agreed any other questions? Just a quick one from my start, I'll stick one in again. Uh, you mentioned but it was probably the previous section as well, but it's tidy with this one. You talked about Hope Valley and said the condition of the ballast there, and I'm probably thinking from a project perspective. Uh, I think quite yeah. often people think, oh, we can get a quick line speed increase over this route. It's not that far off that at the moment. But you were kind of going back on a, a on an asset that you're just maintaining on a on a day-to-day -day basis, just to even a small increase. I guess that's going to trigger 
uh, us assessing what the underlying ballast conditions are. Yeah, yeah. It's really tired along that route, do you? The, the ballast is. The really whole family. I'm just looking at this now with Scott, actually, strange enough, uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, everybody seems to look looking at this route at the moment, and uh, I'm, I'm the yeah. latest one. <laughs> Sorry. Just keep, <laughs> just keep looking at it. That's all. <laughs> okay. okay, there's no questions. We'll move on. We've got one final section, Danny. Yeah, just, I think there's only a last yeah. couple, I think, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right, so a little bit about new technology. Um, we talked about the trolley, the cyclic top trolley. There's just a picture of it there, of how we transport it. And um, just a bit of an app. A bit of a trace there that it produces one of our tech guys produces for it so i was just saying before how we go out on, on, on track and we, we work with the gangs then to to remove the cyclic top hopefully if the voiding's been taken care of but we did some design tamping at um hay bar which is the new mills route up to from piccadilly to new mills um this was it really fell away um we did a top and line survey come back put it through design route uh got the got the tamper there book there and then we put the tech team and the the p -way staff there with with stone and we did some really big lifts and we achieved we achieved the design really so it was a good a good work on the next page it carries on so as you can see on the left there that was our pre pre-trace it was a had some Level two twist through it, cyclic top. Um, the alignment wasn't great, and then the post. The post was here, so we'd done some really excellent work there with the. And one of our tech tech guys got passed out TQS, and so he did the TQS in on it, which is the track quality supervisor with the sample. A little bit there on the CCQs, I would. It stayed static round four to five. This is the SD values, and then we did a very poor, and then we brought it right back into a, a good a good band. So and the alignment was good as well from satisfactory. So that was a good bit of work that guys did. Uh, there's a picture of the PLPR. So as I said before, the pattern, 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 plain line pattern recognition train. So this has helped us. It's reduced our walking probably by about. I'm just guessing it's seventy percent. But we only walk junctions now. We don't walk plain line, which was quite a big thing for us because we've got three, three to four, uh, four major tunnels on my patch and we had to walk them on a saturday night so it was quite uh, la laborious really so that helped us out loads um, and then there's a picture there on the right of the images it sends through sometimes you get and we have to review that then and action accordingly the supervisor will just something we've recently picked up on for hot weather we've got some yeltec remote thermometers these would work out about you can get range between 900 quid or up to 1400 quid a set and you can have them to texture uh, you can use it through the in intelligent infrastructure which you we use for points heating to tell us how, how hot the points are so we can that's something we use there i think that's it so have you got any other questions yeah, Paul Waterhouse, I've got a question. How often does the PLPR train run? And do they send you the whole run or just the extracts of where they've got problems? So the plan run for the train is um, every month. We have, it, we have it planned every four weeks to run. Sometimes it'll miss and then we have to risk assess it and see if we've walked it or we've got any bad sites through there that we want to just go and pinpoint. Um, so we do that it's meant to run every four weeks sometimes it doesn't run every four weeks or it'll miss some mileage and then that gets faulted then through fault control the miss mileage and we'll pick it up and then do a risk assessment which the supervisor does and i have to authorize as the engineer so that's how often it should run and what was your other question sorry does it just then send you those uh, extracts of where the problems are or do you have to look at all of the whole no no run? It sends everything. It just sends the problems. So we have three three different reports. We have we have an immediate report. So anything that's an immediate action fault. So anything that a patrolman would find. So anything that was going to fall off the edge of a cliff, back before yeah. the next run, then we'll get something which is 
that we it's what it wants us to look at their, their view on is that it might fail within the next three months so we'd look at that as if it was a supervisor looking at it and then we get the ballast reports as well so it tells us where we've got high ballast low ballast um so we get, get i think it's three 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 reports we get off it or four right, reports thanks, thanks. In, in uh, the, there's a couple um, of questions. Sorry, just a minute. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so, uh, Peter Halliwell, lots, thanks, Danny. Lots of great graphics. How good, uh, complete, and accurate are your asset records? Is one question. Is uh, PLT still in Jogis? How easy yeah. is it to manage? And the question PLT is how easy is it to manage your work bank and register of defects? So. There's a couple of ones. How uh, complete and accurate is, is your asset records, and how easy is it to manage your work bank and track defects? So accuracy of our work and asset rec our asset records are better than what they were. They're not brilliant, but they're better. Um, we, we're still still finding bits of pre seventy six rail, for instance, that we thought we'd found all of it. Then we'd find like little islands when we go out and walk it. So we find some of them sometimes. Uh, it's hard to manage our work bank. We have quite a lot of work in our work bank. Um, and we have a register of trap defects. We use RDMS for that. So it's a rail, rail defect management system. And then we, we review, I review that every week anyway. The, the, it's part of our weekly meeting with the section manager. We review that, making sure all the defects are planned. Um, and then we I sign off any trap Trap geometry defects when I go up to the section. So I, I, I review them and assign them off as well. But yeah, it's uh, it's, it's not an easy job managing the work bank, but the section managers manage it more than me. I've got a couple of other questions in there. I know Kev had one as well. I'll just, just yeah, it's a bit on mind uh, Yeah, just do the ones in the chat first, Kev. Sorry. Uh, so in, in Scotland, this is Tony Elkington. Please forgive me that wrong. In Scotland, we have to walk the tunnels as PLPR doesn't cover these areas. What was the process for getting this signed off? Um, so we we had the well, I don't know well, it should be it should be, it should be tunnels. Is it a different? Is it is are the tunnels um, the track configuration that the PLPR doesn't recognise? That's the only reason I can think it wouldn't do it. So. Well, Tony, do you want to come on? Slab, slab trap, yeah. right? It won't, yeah. re it won't recognise slab trap. It only that's why you have you have to walk your tunnels still. So uh, well, the last one sorry. in the chat. I think Graham Bleach uh, has done and got an opinion on whether maintenance requirements are involved in track design early enough so design so so that as designers we don't pass on significant maintenance liabilities. Did I make that sense of that? So, have you got an opinion on whether uh, maintenance requirements are involved in the track design process early enough so, as designers, we don't pass on significant risks? Um, I, I don't. I don't think they are. Sometimes, well, majority of the time. So, we get the design. I think we get a design at form A day. I think the day of the thing. We might do what well, we, and then it's more or less. Yeah, I know people presented earlier than that, but I know you get that. Yeah, we we get it's getting better. I think we're getting better at it, and we have regular conversations for the TIU, for instance. We have a lot of conversations about what we what as a maintainer we need to be able to keep maintaining it. Um, but historically, they would never. I don't think they were done at an early enough stage because so there's, there's a lot of projects that have been handed back. And it's just been a nightmare for the maintainer to look after. So yeah, that's definitely an area of focus, isn't it? Um, so just Kev, you had a question, and then I'll probably look to close the meeting, Kev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dave. Um, at Harrogate, uh, uh, Dan, you, you were doing some uh, concrete sleeper replacements there, you know, and you said you, you referred to the um, the ranch uh, structures and that. Is that is, is that uh, something that you can get a decision on rapidly then to, to make him those decisions? On you know, on, in such cases, you know, to me, yeah, with so, the additional loading yeah. on, on, on the yeah, on the that, that, that's why we had to do that. Yeah, um, it wasn't a bad turnaround actually. We 
it was I think it helped as well that the fact that we'd had a rough ride there and it was a we didn't want another rough ride obviously to because of the delays and the and the passenger perception we just were like fools one way we would not done anything about it um, so we did. We did over egg it when we. Well, we didn't over egg it. We told the truth and said, "Look, it's a, it's a, a repeat rough ride site. So we need to go and change these sleepers through there. Oh, is the structure good enough to take the extra load of the concrete sleepers?" And we got back to us quite recently. It was. Uh, I'm sure it was only about. I think it was only a week. I don't even think they went out on site. I think they just looked at their records. <laughs> said yeah it'll take the extra load and he asked us for a couple of questions how, how heavy are the sleepers and how many sleepers we'd be putting on there and would we be putting more stone on and we and we, we answered them questions and they were quite it was quite a good turnaround really and and your ballast depth were okay and stuff like that i guess yeah 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 yeah, yeah everything was fine with it yeah. just one very quick question is new mills tunnels yours daniel yeah 20 mile an hour what's that do to 20 mile an hour new mills tunnel yeah new mills new mills new mills new mills near new mills central uh, i believe so i just see it as new mills tunnel as i saw the 20 mile an hour on it and i wondered if it was a gauge thing i think it is a gauge thing yeah it's very tight yeah. through there we meant to have a renewal through there but mm. i think it was something to do with the gauge the tight gauge through there so we've had some designs through to help us with any tampering that we want to do okay uh, that, thanks, Dave. Th thanks, Daniel. Okay, no uh, so, so I'll just bring. Uh, oh, was it, I think it was Paul's come back with a really interesting presentation. Thanks, Daniel. It's good to see some traditional maintenance and more recent uh, innovations. Many thanks. James Moore, uh, using track X analysis during the design process can reduce future maintenance and, and, yeah. and prolongment. So that's probably a statement. To some yeah. extent. Um, so, if I just do a very quick vote of thanks, I know we're slightly overrun, but I mean, that, I think that's really uh, beneficial, uh, Danny. So, Danny, thanks, thanks for being uh, for going through all the kind of the processes you need to go through in maintenance. I, I appreciate. I don't think that the, the, the probably from the design side we realise all these uh, different mechanisms and, and the maintenance processes you need to go to. Also, the, the, the actual information that you need to assess. Uh, I think you were absolutely candid with where your frustrations are, and I think there's obviously benefits of uh, projects probably need to take on board. I definitely took a note on that. I know you mentioned before about uh, making sure we take the maintenance colleagues' input yeah, on board early on. So, if we can ask colleagues who were on the call to unmute and uh, if we can give. Uh, Danny, a round of applause and thank you for his presentation today. Thank you, Dan. Okay, thanks a lot, Danny.